it's um, Erev Rosh Hashanah. Well done for getting to this shiur today because it really is um, just before Rosh Hashanah. So I know lots of people are cooking, shopping, running around. And here we are learning Torah. So that's amazing. Um, okay, so I want to um, explore a section of the Rosh Hashanah service which really encapsulate so much of what Rosh Hashanah is really about. And hopefully this will give us a, a very good indication of what is our avoider, what is the spiritual work of Rosh Hashanah. And I hope to take it to a very deep level. And this should assist us in really understanding um, where our heart needs to be on this day of Rosh Hashanah. So first of all, let's get a, a beautiful understanding from the Kabbalistic masters into what's actually happening, happening over this time from candle lighting, which is called Erev Rosh Hashanah. And the Kabbalistic masters teach, and this is um, quoted by, by the Rebbe, that what happens on Erev Rosh Hashanah from approximately candle lighting is that everything reverts to its primordial state. What does that actually mean? It means that the inner will of Hashem, and I'll describe it and then we'll explain it so that it becomes very clear. So according to the Kabbalah, the inner will of God actually ascends from this world and all the worlds and is retracted into the divine essence into the essence of Hashem. And what is left is the external will of God. And it is that that sustains the world from this point on. What does that mean? What are we really talking about? Imagine yourself, right? You know that there's a part of you, right? That is your deepest part, your deepest will. And then there is a more external part of you. So the external part of you is what you will express when you're out in public, when you see people, when you're engaging. And that's like your public persona, so to speak. And then you have your external will, sorry, your internal will. And that is the part of you that really can only be expressed in a place where you feel most safe. It's, it's a part of you that really only can show itself within a safe environment, when you're, for instance, with your family, um, with close friends, with people that you really feel you can trust. This is reflective of the divine very, very small level. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that God, in many ways, retracts so much of himself. He's, and the way that it is put across in mystical terminology is God retracts his, his essence or his internal self, or as said in Kabbalistic terminology, his inner will, from the world at this time of Erev Rosh Hashanah. And so the, there's like a cosmic slumber that takes place during this time. What happens when we're asleep? The body still functions. All the organs of the body still function. And in the same way, the world continues to function. The sun will still rise. The wind will still blow. All of the plants and, and, and flowers and trees will continue to grow. The body that still functions when one is asleep. However, when we're asleep, our self is not there. You can't go to a person who's asleep and speak to them because they're not going to engage with you. They are somewhere else. And so too with the divine over this, this initial period of Rosh Hashanah. So Hashem allows his external will to sustain the world, but it's sustained in a very, very weak way, so to speak. And 
and his internal will has retracted or retreated. And what we are told is that there is like a divine detachment that's happening during this time. God himself is actually looking down at the world and deciding whether he desires to be and invest himself into this world again. So it's a very, very strange time. And it's a spiritually very, very weak time, so to speak. It's interesting because we are told that over this time, um, yes, yay, okay, this way you're not going to have distractions, so, okay, so we are told that actually over this time, Sadikim, people who are very, very spiritually sensitive feel physically weak because they feel that there is like a lack of or a diminution in divine light that takes place during this period of time. It's amazing to have that awareness. It's amazing to get these beautiful mystical teachings of what's going on on a spiritual level during this time. Now, let's not keep you in suspense for too long. Where does Hashem invest himself back in the world? Like, boy, what's happening? The world seems to be teetering. It's like on the brink of almost extinction at this time. So we are told that the next day, when there is a cry, when the sound of the shofar pierces through the worlds and reverberates through the heavens, at that moment, that is so pleasurable to Hashem. And everything that the shofar represents draws Hashem back down into this world. It's at that moment that Hashem desires to reinvest himself into this world. And therefore, what happens is that Hashem sends again his inner will into the world, but it's a completely new light, right? It's a, as we said um, in our previous Shurim, there is a new emanation that now vests into the world. So that's what's happening over this period of Rosh Hashanah. And now let's have a look and delve into our role in regard to this overall um, construct into what's happening during this period of time. I'm going to look at it specifically with regard to the Musaf service, which encapsulates the three parts of the service that are fundamental to this time of Rosh Hashanah. And we are told, and I'm just going to refer to my notes, that during the Musaf service, there are three parts that are, um, that are spoken of that make up this, this service, or three additional parts. Remember that the word Musaf actually means additional. Because if we look every day during a normal day, there are three times or three parts to the service of a Jew. Shacharit, Mincha, and Mariv. Okay, or actually, because the day starts at sunset, you would say Mariv, Shacharit, and Mincha. And these actually correspond with the services that would take place in the base of Mikdash, in the temple. But whenever there was a Yom Tov or a Shabbos or a Rosh Chodesh, the new month, there would always be an additional service that would be brought in in the base of Mikdash. And it would involve um, additional sacrifices, etc. So this additional service is the Musaf that we do, and we'll do it now over this Rosh Hashanah period as well. And it entails three parts, or three parts are added, and they are what we call Malchius, Zichronus, and Shofres, which translate as kingship, remembrances, and shofar, the sounding of the shofar. So from this, we're going to understand really what is required of us on Rosh Hashanah, and specifically from this idea of Malchus. 
So Hashem actually asks us, if we look in scripture, Hashem says, say before me verses which speak about my kingship. And this is what Hashem desires of us. So what we could say is happening on a simpler level is that over the period of Pesach, what happened? Hashem extracted us from this thick of slavery. Hashem extracted us from an intense slavery, which we ourselves would not have been able to be liberated from through our own efforts. And Hashem reached down to, so to speak, and he took us out of this slavery. And if you look at Pesach time, it's not that we had merit. It's not that we did anything to merit being removed and liberated from Mitzrayim. And at this time, a nation was born. The Jewish people became a nation. And so we say that at the time of Pesach, Hashem chose us. And really, the initiative came from above to below. Now, it's Rosh Hashanah time. And what Hashem is doing is, He removes Himself and He says, I already chose you, my children. I already chose you, my nation. But now I'm asking you to choose me. I created this beautiful world. And we actually celebrated the creation of the world on Monday, which was Chof Hei Elo, the 25th day of Elo. That was the first day of creation. And it was perfection. And if we look at nature, we see the beauty of God. We see the perfection of this world. And on Rosh Hashanah, we've mentioned this before, we celebrate the creation of man. And that is because Hashem didn't just want to create this beautiful world in which he could dwell. Let's look at it as though we were given unlimited funds and we could build a home. And you can build whatever you want, a beautiful big swimming pool, a manicured garden, many bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms, a magnificent dining room with a beautiful big table, whatever you want. What are you going to want to put in it? What do you want in your home? And it's funny, I was asking my students this the other day in the high school, and I got so many different answers. One said, I want servants. Another one said, I want food. Somebody said, I want beautiful ornaments. I said, all those things are beautiful. Is that it? Are you sure you're gonna be happy living in your home with all those things? Until finally someone said, I want my family. I want the people I love with me in my home. And yes, that's what it is. Because if you build this magnificent, perfect home, everything is set up for you. But you don't have that relationship. If you don't have connection with other people, the connection that is real and intimate, then you're not going to feel as warm and as whole in your home. So too with God. He made this beautiful world. But what Hashem wants in this world is an authentic relationship with us. So, even though this is the day where we crown Hashem as King, Hashem is not going to try and enforce this kingship on us. Very beautiful and important part of understanding this energy of Rosh Hashanah. Hashem is not going to compel us as a tyrant to accept him and coronate him as king. No. God wants us to voluntarily submit ourselves to him, to, to actually choose him as our king. And so Hashem, through his own volition, empowers us, the Jewish people, to impact on him. Of course, God is absolute perfection and he needs nothing. But he enabled this 
need for us or this desire for us, the Jewish people. And that should evoke a deep feeling within us that God, so to speak, made himself vulnerable to us. That is so beautiful. And it should shake us out of any complacency that we have. How can we not respond to that? This is the creator of the world. Every time I take a breath, that is my creator and his rachamim, his mercy on me. And so at this time of Rosh Hashanah, God desires that we show him our deep desire that he should be our king. And this is the service of Malchios. So we need to go within ourselves and actually cultivate this desire for God. When we are praying, we have to be very careful that we're not just knocking off a whole lot of words. Now, if you look at the if you look at the Mahzor for Rosh Hashanah, it's a lot 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 of prayers and during that time we need to meditate we need to think within ourselves and work within ourselves to reach out to god and call on him from the very depths of our being from the deepest place within us to come back and be king over us and this is what God desires from us. I tried to give a marshal. I tried to give a, um, a parable when I was in class. And I'd like to share it with you also. Because I think it shows how much Hashem wants an authentic relationship with us. And why. Think about it. God could have created a world. He could have even created people who in a very robotic way would simply do his will. It's kind of like, let's say you had the opportunity for a shida and you meet this guy and he's got everything that you would want in a spouse. He's got, he's got a kindness, he seems to have a wisdom, he has patience, I don't know, whatever it is, he's good looking, whatever it is that would speak to you. Um, he's driven, but not in an arrogant way, you know, in a responsible way. And when you are asked, you say, I would like to make a marriage with this man. I would like to build a life with this man and really share myself with the man. And when he's asked, what's his response? She's very nice. She's pretty. She comes from a good family. She seems to have good mirrors. So, okay, like if it's the right thing to do, I'll marry her. You know, it seems, it seems like on paper it's a good thing. I, I'll, yeah, okay, I'm willing. Do you really want to marry someone like that? Do you want to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't desire you properly and long for you and want to build a life with you and share themselves with you? No. No. <laughs> right. right. And so too with Hashem. Hashem really, really desires a reciprocal relationship with us but he desires to be king over us and that makes sense because after all God Almighty is the creator and master of the world but you cannot really be a king unless you have willing subjects unless you have subjects who really desire that you rule over them and those subjects trust that you are perfectly just, that everything you do comes from perfection, comes from the deepest love, that everything that comes upon us is not anything that could err, but is absolutely correct and absolutely for our own benefit. That is what Hashem desires of us on this day of Rosh Hashanah. So let's now move in the service so that we can understand how it's expressed with the shofar. We come to the next part, which is called Zechronus. And 
just quite simply, what are these remembrances? So the first thing is that it is a day of judgment. And yet we are told that here too we express a trust and a, a, a depth in our relationship with Hashem in that although it's a day of judgment, our prophets have counseled us to be besimcha on this day, that we should be happy. And what's brought out, the teaching that's brought out is that we buy new clothing, we have haircuts, we, um, we prepare meat and wine for our meals over this 48 hour period. Now, if somebody is facing a, a trial and they're facing a jury, usually they're going to be wearing dark clothing, they're going to be unkempt, they won't cut their hair, they may not, um, they may not shave, the Chabad counsels us not to shave our beards, okay, but um, they're not going to look after themselves, they're certainly not going to wear new clothing, um, they're probably going to lose their appetite. That's how a person feels if they have a court case pending. But we, B'nai Israel, why do we act differently? Because we trust our God. Because we trust Hashem that we will indeed come out having had a good judgment brought upon us. And that's how we have to approach Rosh Hashanah. Remember, it's this relationship between me and my God, the perfect, divine, just, and loving King. And therefore, I trust Him that I will come out of this period having triumphed and having been given a good judgment for the year. But Zichroinos, remembrances, means that Hashem also recalls all our deeds from the past year, which is also beautiful, because how many beautiful things have each one of us done? We give tzedakah, and now Erev Rosh Hashanah is a time to increase in tzedakah. We, we've shown kindness. This time of lockdown, it seems to me that I've seen so many acts of kindness, of, of people coming out of the woodwork and reaching out to others and just doing good things. And you don't know how much merit that brings to us, how much light that brings down to our world. We've taught our children. We send them to Jewish schools. And every time a, a Jewish child says words of Torah, says words of prayer of tefillah, who says the Shema, it says in, in, in scripture, it says in the Torah, and from the mouths of young children and babies, Hashem establishes might, which means that it is so precious to Hashem when children say words of Torah because of their purity, because of their innocence, that with those words, Hashem actually conquers our enemies. We are victorious because of the words of the children. And so there's so much that we as B'nai Israel are doing. You've educated your children in a Jewish school. You have Shabbat together. You say brachas over the challah and the wine. There's so much good we've done as well. And now in these last days, we should maximize the good that we possibly can do. These days just before Rosh Hashanah because everything is remembered. What else falls under Zichroinus? What else is remembered? Hashem recalls in His mercy all of the good things that our ancestors have done. And He brings that in order to give us merit. So, Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, is recalled all the things that our ancestors have done in the past which can bring us merit that is also recalled by our loving father and king in order to benefit us and then all of these things the Malchus and the Zechronos these all together are actually expressed in the sound of the show. And that is why at that time, when, when there's this cry of the shofar, it is at that time that Hashem reinvests himself in the world as our king. 
So what is the sound of the shofar? We know it's a very raw cry. It doesn't have different melodies. It doesn't have different notes. It's very real. And it re represents the depth of our cry from within us. That's what the shofar really is. The shofar represents just this basic soul cry from B'nai Israel, from each one of us to our king, calling on him to come down and reinvest himself in this world, to reinvest his inner world, his inner world back in this world, and that we should be his subjects once again. The beauty of the shofar we see in so many different ways. If you look at the shape of the shofar, it's bent. It's never really like this straight shofar that looks like that. Okay, it's always a bent horn. Some of the horns are um, more bent, like you get those spiral ones. But but most of the time, it's, it's a simple ram's horn. And from this, we see that we too can learn a lesson that we too should bend our will to the will of the Almighty. And we see that where we blow um, from the shofar, it's a small opening. And then it expands out into a wider opening. And according to Jewish law, according to halacha, we are actually not permitted to try and blow the shofar from the wider opening. It's forbidden. Why? Because we see that we are told that we call out to Hashem from our pain, from a place of constriction, from a smaller place. And when we call out from our heart, then Hashem will respond with abundance in a broad way, in the same way that the shofar broadens out to its opening where the sound comes out of it. And in fact, Hashem tells us himself from this shape of the shofar, he says, if you open for me an opening, just a small opening from within your heart, the size of the eye of a needle, I will open up for you and I will respond to the size of a banquet hall. So this is the avoid of the day of Rosh Hashanah. This is the work of the day of the Rosh Hashanah that we need to try and evoke feelings from our heart. We need to try and feel a desire for Hashem. And that's not always so easy. But if we can just look around us, if we can try and focus with great gratitude for everything that we see is God's blessings, and we should know that Hashem's blessings are so abundant, there's so much that he does for us that we do not even know about, that we do not even see. And another thing that is very, very beautiful and allows us to feel a deep connection with Hashem is this idea of surrender. So when things don't go our way, when there is times of suffering, it feels like pain and challenge. The best thing we can do is meditate on the fact that this comes to us from goodness. It does come from Hashem's love. And for some reason, it is all good. If we can appreciate that and surrender by saying, Hashem, I understand. What you're giving me is somehow your kindness is somehow to my benefit. And we can actually feel that surrender. We also, through that, we break so much of the intensity of what's happening in terms of pain and suffering. In fact, I don't know if I've shared this idea with you before, but there's a beautiful teaching by Rabbi Nachman that illustrates the source of everything that we get from Hashem. And this helps us to try and 
you reach that point of surrender. Rabbi Nachman teaches as follows. He says, everything that comes from God, the source is always love. And he illustrates it very beautifully. He says, whether we're experiencing what feels like sweet, revealed blessings from Hashem, from the side of, of, of chesed, of rachamim, the side of, um, of kindness, or it feels like we're experiencing din, we're experiencing judgment and severity, gavura, which comes from that side of gavura. He says, whichever it is, it all comes from echad, from one place, and that is ahava, that is God's love. And he shows us very beautifully, and he says, look at the gematria of the two words, look at the numerical value of both these words because the word for echad one has the same numerical value as ava as love and they both equal 13. the more that we can meditate on that and surrender to god as our king the more we actually then begin to reveal the blessings that really come from hashem that are, in, in its origin, everything that comes from God is a blessing. And of course, it should be done the same with joy. So I just want to bring an idea of the beautiful effects that take place through our work to feel connected on high, to feel connected to Hashem, and to feel this um, deep, desire and love for Hashem. And I, I, I hope I'm not um, engendering feelings of pressure at all, um, because Hashem sees our effort, and we also must ask Him to assist us in this avoida, in this um, spiritual work that we are doing. And of course, it's a consistent progression. So we try, and then we have to keep trying and try again, and eventually, we will carve out, carve ourselves out, so to speak, as the Prefer Rebbe says, into a vessel which can then receive Hashem's light. So there's a beautiful teaching in, in the Hayom Yom that's associated with Yom Kippur and the Yom Kippur service. And it illustrates really what happens through our connection with God. And you can feel that deep connection. But Hashem sees our efforts, and that's what's really precious. And the Hayom Yom cites how when the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh Hakadoshim, into the Holy of Holies, on this very, very special day, and he, and he offers the incense offering, it is a moment of the deepest, most intense connection with Hashem that can take place throughout the year. This is the holiest moment um, with the holiest person in the holiest place in the entire year. And in that moment, the Kohen Gadol has to be completely focused on God, completely consumed with God. And we know that if, if God forbid he wasn't, then he might die. So what happened was the Kohen Gadol always had like a rope tied around him because if there was something untoward, or that wasn't correct in his service, he might die in this Holy of Holies. And nobody else was just allowed to go into such a place of intense light and holiness. And so the rope was there so that he could be pulled out if God forbid this happened. God forbid. But what does it show us? It shows us this connection that happened during this time and, and the potential for that attachment to God in this moment where he offered up the Katiris, the incense offering in the Holy of Holies. And when he came out successfully, the, the Koyan Gadol would offer a simple, short prayer to God. And then he would go out and the people would rejoice and go, and many people would, would wait for a very long time to actually and congratulate him on a successful service and you know the men would shake his hand and whatever and the question that is asked is 
Why? After having this time of closeness with Hashem, why did the Kohen Gadol come out and say such a short prayer? Shouldn't he have maximized this time and actually had a whole list of things that he should have asked Hashem for on behalf of Bnei Israel? It should have been, you know, he, sh he should have taken this time of connection and maximized on it and made a long intensive prayer. And the answer is no. And the Friedrich Rebbe brings it out for us and explains, no, because just by virtue of that connection, that desire from within the Kohen Gadol for God, which evokes Hashem's desire back for us, and this was on behalf of all of B'nai Israel, by virtue of that connection, he has drawn down myriads and myriads of blessings for B'nai Israel. And this is taught um, in Hasidic terminology with an idea called Mayim Nukvim, which we can delve into another time, please God. But when we desire God and we can cultivate that, that feeling and that longing and that love, then what happens is that from above, this is reflected and it, we draw down that, that love back to ourselves, but we also draw down a abundant blessings. We tap into storehouses of blessings through this. And of course that's what we want on this day of Rosh Hashanah. That's what we want to do. Remember how we said this day is the day where we create the DNA from which the entire year will extend. Okay, but we're not perfect and we have to keep that in mind. And so we just must try. And by virtue of being here learning Torah right now, we're all putting in the effort. This is our effort to try and prepare ourselves for this day. And Hashem understands us so deeply and completely. And so it's our effort that really, really matters. And our sincerity and our sincere um, request from Hashem to help us and to bless us, to recognize that He's the perfect, most loving King over us. So let's inject some beautiful hope for this new time that we're about to go into. It's, a, it, it's wonderful and thank God now. It's a time of renewal. It's Rosh Hashanah because we've had tough sheep pay 5780 and there's been a darkness that has descended on the world. There's been this, this pandemic and the knock-on effect for the entire world. And we should keep in mind that on this day, it's not just the Jewish people that is being judged, but the entire world is being judged on this day. And I read somewhere, and I heard this from Rabbi Fishman, who shared it with my daughters in, in Torah Academy High School, and then I've looked it up and I've seen it again online. There are many, many tzaddikim who have predicted that Tav Shin Pei Aleph 5781, the year we're going into, is going to be the year of Mashiach. But we've had predictions like this before. However, we need to believe that Mashiach is coming. And there are many who've never spoken about Mashiach before, who now are speaking of Mashiach. They say it's imminent. Suffice it to say this, that I heard this quote, and, um, and I looked it up and, and confirmed it, that the Hassan Sofer, who lived in the 1700s, predicted that 5780 would indeed be, be a difficult year. And there's some that's, that quote him as saying it would be a satanic year, it would be a year of incredible darkness, but that in 5781, that Hashem would indeed raise up the fallen. And so we should expect a year of blessing. We've had a Yarida, which means we've had a descent. But there is no way, according to the spiritual principles that we are taught in Hasidus, there is no way to have a great ascent, to have great light, unless we first have a darkness, unless we first have a descent. And so thank God we've experienced it now. And now we must ask Hashem to reveal the light that should follow so that we experience the Aliyah 
the ascent that should come after the Yoreda, after the descent. And we have to make sure that we've changed through this period so that we become more of a vessel for the light that God desires to fill us with. And so we each need to think about the mitzvot that we're taking on or the mitzvot that we're going to strengthen ourselves in. And in this way, we are all assisting in drawing down light and healing for the world. It's not our place to be complacent about this because we impact the entire world. We have to do all we can to assist in this process. And let's start now by giving tzedakah, which is so incredibly powerful and it can truly change negative decrees. We should do that and feel this rachamim and feel this mercy for our fellow Jews and give tzedakah and we specifically have to give first to Jewish charities. And, and hopefully that will be reflected in the heavenly realms that in the same way as we are showing mercy and rachamim to others, Hashem will then show mercy and rachamim to all of us. So I'll leave you with that. Please God, I, I'm not sure we're going to have a shiur next week. I'll check with, with um, Sharon and she'll, she'll send out whatever's happening. So, you know, I don't even know myself. But um, please God that we should be welcoming Mashiach before. There have been rockets that have been launched on Eretz Israel in the south. I was reading about it this morning. Terrible. Just when, you know, we're so focused on peace with, with these other Arab nations, the UAE and Bahrain and and the joy that we're experiencing through these, um, you know, through these positive political um, alliances that we are making, of course, there are those who want to bring about destruction. And so we have to do all we can to make sure that we are assisting to bring protection to Eretz Israel, to our land, to our brothers and sisters in Eretz Israel. We must pray for them and. Every mitzvah that we do literally brings a shield over our nation. So I wish you all shana tova umetuka, a good year and the, the blessings, because everything is a blessing, but the blessings should be experienced as sweet, in a sweet revealed way. And thank you ladies for joining me. Shana tova. Shana tova. Thank you, shana tova. Thank you. Hello, Melanie. Thank you, Bridget. Ksivak Savatai Vilashanta Masukha and Mashiach now. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Maya. May your blessings be upon all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. Adele, Denise, Thank you, everybody. Lovely to see everybody here. Bridget, thank you so much for all the amazing classes. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm so happy to be Hola kavot to you, Bridget. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Shana tova. Shana tova. Shana tova to everybody. God bless. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. The bench you are. Amen. Amen.